You're the one, you're the only one. That's what we're going to talk about today, guys. We're talking about the names of Jesus. I'd like to just say hello. Uh, it's, uh, it's so great to be home. Uh, we miss you guys so much. And uh, it's just incredible uh, to, to see the faces that I have, you know, right here. Uh, you know, uh, we miss you guys a lot. We talk about you guys a lot. The Parish Church sends their love. And uh, so excited to talk uh, to you today about the names of Jesus. The title for today is The Pioneer and Perfecter. But before we go there, just want to give you guys, uh, give you guys just a little uh, view of our family that has been growing. Uh, that's... Uh, that's our dear little Luna Claire, who was uh, born three months ago during the pandemic. And uh, so, uh, wow, my wife, uh, she's, she is a strong woman. Uh, she, uh, you know, it's not easy giving birth, period. But certainly during these stressful times, um, you know, I was so proud of her. And she's a gem, Luna. Teo's being a good brother, for the most part, doing pretty good. And, uh, and we send our love Wish we could all uh, be here together and uh, so that I could show you guys uh, like Lion King with Simba uh, or something like that because I'm so proud of my kids. We're going to talk about kids a little bit, um, but uh, I also would like to give you guys just a little bit of a recap, you know, uh, my missions minutes that Doug usually gets to do. I'm, I'm excited to take on that role. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we weren't able to have a uh, North River summer internship uh, this year, you know, I think it would have been the year number six, and uh, and yet I'm just here to tell you that even though we weren't, you guys weren't there, your impact still was made even this summer. You know, uh, we were in confinement for uh, several months where we couldn't leave our homes without, uh, you know, without a form filled out. You had a couple reasons, mandatory masks in the grocery store, all types of things for a few months. And so when the doors opened, uh, you know, it was amazing. But uh, if you look in the uh, top left corner, Romeo was baptized day one outside of his, uh, outside of deconfinement, uh, which uh, started off a two-month period where we saw 11 baptisms in the parish church, nine of them being uh, teenagers and campus students. You know, the interesting thing about Romeo is he was actually met two years ago during the summer internship that you guys took part in. Uh, he was met when we were out there sharing our faith, and it took him some time, but he made the decision to be baptized, make Jesus the Lord of his life. If you look in the bottom right, you see Gabriel, who was baptized. And, uh, you know, Gabriel is actually, you love when family, when you're able to reach your family. And uh, Gabriel is actually the brother of Adrian. And if, uh, if you remember me talking about Adrian, I, it's hard for me not to. Adrian's an amazing brother, a leader in the Paris campus ministry. But uh, you, that's his younger brother. And in fact, he was baptized three years to the day of when his uh, older brother was baptized. And uh, that wouldn't have happened without three years ago, you guys sending people with faith uh, to share your faith and uh, to reach out to that, that, that group of people. Um, you know, to that group of uh, people. And now Gabriel is your brother. You have over here, you have Taj, who was baptized, who was also a family member, but she was studied the Bible with a girl named Emma and Margot. Emma was met by Adrian. And so again, the impact that you made on a few people's lives, it's multiplied, it continues to multiply. I love the photo on the top right. That's five teenagers who got baptized within the course of about eight days. And uh, wow, uh, so inspired. It's not easy to make decisions as a teenager, and yet uh, w the faith that they, uh, that they had to make that decision during deconfinement, they used it as an opportunity to grow closer to God. They were in Bible studies with college students, with their parents. They dug into the scriptures, and because of that, you know, they were baptized. We saw a couple single women baptized as well, but uh, God is moving, and, uh, you know, thanks be to God, absolutely, but also because of our partnership. We're so grateful that you guys continue to pray for us and have us on your hearts. You know, uh, today uh, we're going to talk about the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. And, uh, you know, pioneer, we, we understand, right? He set the way, right? He paved the way. He set the example. What's this perfecter thing mean? You know, how did he perfect our faith? 
Hebrews 5 would say, son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. You know, Jesus needed to be perfected. He was the perfecter, and he perfected his faith through what he suffered. You know, 1 Peter 1 has something to say about our suffering. I know times can be hard. You know, this is a a serious time of trial for many of us. And yet, in in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though for now a little while you have suffered grief in all kinds of trials. They have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, there's something about faith that unless there's trials, it cannot be perfected. And even Jesus, he needed to perfect the faith through suffering. We're going to read a passage today that's very Special to me, I'll share a little bit more in detail why, but we're going to start off in Hebrews 12, verse 2. I'm sure uh, it's a passage familiar to many of us. I understand that you guys even studied Hebrews uh, not too long ago. But we're going to start in verse 2 and go um, go through 11. And it says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Verse 2, Fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted yet to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons or daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and of peace for those who have been trained by it. And this is my son. And uh, me and my son, we have a lot of training moments, and it's one of, my fa- one of my joys in my life is that I get to train my son to be a man of God who knows how to love, who knows how to obey, who knows how to be honest and kind and generous, and it's such a joy. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when I think about this passage, primarily uh, verse 11, I often think, oh yeah, this is for kids. I'm not sure if you were one of those children that your parents made you memorize this passage as a kid. Uh, This was definitely one that I had memorized. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and of peace for those who have been trained by it. Chase, was that you? Did you memorize that one? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe Chase memorized that one. Yeah, he did. Okay, Sherwin can testify to that. You know, uh, this is... You know, it's true. This is, this is a good passage for children. And make no mistake about it. You know, discipline is an essential thing for child development. And I hope that as parents, we are using any, many forms of discipline to help raise our children to love God. You know, looking back, I'm so grateful 
for the efforts, the painstaking efforts that my parents took to really help train me in the Lord. That being said, I know that not all fathers, not all families have really experienced the same model of love that is used during discipline. And so if you as a parent, as me, often feel lost, how do I take care of my kids? What do I do? I just encourage you to find parents in the church, godly men and women who you can go to for help on what does this really look like? Because certainly godly discipline is not the way, is not like the way the world implements discipline. But make no mistake about it, it's essential, it's necessary. But believe it or not, this passage is not talking to children. This is not written for five-year-olds. This is written for you and me. This is written for adults. This is written to a, a group of disciples, a group of believers, uh, and that means it's for us today. You know, for me, this passage is, is extremely important. I'm, you know, it's probably up there, top couple passages that really did change my life. Uh, instrumental in my development. I was so excited when I saw the theme being Fix Your Eyes on Jesus because it immediately brought me to a moment in time when, uh, you know, wasn't always married, didn't always have this family, this amazing son, and there was certainly a moment in time that if I did not read this passage, everything that you saw, those pictures that you saw, would not have happened at all. You know, I was, uh, Courtney and I were dating, and, uh, and because of the help of people in my life, it was becoming more and more clear that I was not doing right in my relationship with God. I was hurting, I was struggling, and to save detail, I know that we have children, you know, watching, but, you know, I struggled with pride, and certainly purity was on, looking at the, on the internet in places where I shouldn't have been, and I was, I was struggling. My wife, you know, my, or my girlfriend at the time, Courtney, you know, we were pure in our relationship, but, uh, but I struggled in my own personal walk. And it came a point in time when I needed to be honest with, with Courtney. I really couldn't hide it. It wasn't right. And I remember her, you know, sharing and her thanking me for, for my openness, but saying, hey, I need, I need some time to really reflect on this. And those 48 hours in between phone calls, because we were long distance, were some of the hardest couple, you know, hours of my life. And I just so happened to be reading through Hebrews. And I just so happened to, the day of, when I got that call, the hour before I was reading Hebrews 12. And Courtney, Courtney called me, and you know, I'll sum up a 45 or 30 minute conversation in a few sentences, but, but you know, she said, you know, Tom, I, I love you, but, and I want to believe that you love me, but by your actions, you don't. And we've been pure in our relationship with God. I've been pure in my relationship with God, but I cannot be with an impure man. And she broke up with me that day. And, you know, it took about 19 months for us to rectify that relationship. And at that time, I, you know, it was over. And I remember the turning point in that conversation. I hung up the phone. And you know those moments where you have you have like two choices in front of you, that I'm, I'm going to respond to this well, or I'm going to allow my emotions to overtake me, to be devastated, and to, to run rampant. And I remember I just read this passage, and this was the lesson, this was the one thought that was crystal clear. It was, wow, God must really love me. You know, I was being disciplined in a serious way in that moment. You know, for a 19 or 20 year old, there's like not, not many things worse than a breakup, right? You learn later on in life that there, it can get worse, different things, but certainly in that moment, it was devastating. But I remember going, oh my goodness, God loves me. Why, why does he love me? You know, God saw the trajectory in my life in that moment. And he knew that unless I course correct my son, you know, he's going the wrong direction. You know, we look in this passage, and what do we see? We see in verse 6, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. You know, he, it says that God, when he disciplines you, he's treating you as children. 
It says, in fact, if you are not disciplined, you're not legitimate. You're not sons or daughters at all. And finally, it says that God disciplines us for our good. You know, it can be hard to interpret God's discipline as a good thing, as love. You know, oftentimes we almost can treat it as a bad word. Even, you know, I I was hesitant to use the word discipline and to change it over time because it's just kind of one of those words that make you cringe a little bit sometimes, doesn't it? it? It feels like a bad word. You know, maybe it's because of our past experiences with family where it's such a negative connotation with it that we go, this can't be good. Honestly, quite frankly, it could, it could come with, with experiences in the church, with leadership where you have just felt like this has not been done or implemented with love. And yet the fact of the matter is that discipline is good. It's for our good. Why? so that we might share in his holiness. You know, holiness is what it's all about. You know, in fact, if we keep looking, and if we read this passage well, I, I think it's safe to say that holiness is impossible without discipline. You know, which one, which one of you want to be holy today? You know, without discipline, you won't be able to experience the holiness that you so desire. Interesting thing to to notice as we fix our eyes on Jesus is Jesus, the most loved, was disciplined the most. You know, we learned something about discipline here that it's not just, oh, you did something bad and so trials come or difficulties come. Jesus did nothing wrong. And yet he experienced discipline, right? There are some moments we are being corrected because of our sin. And other moments where God is just using a trial that may not have been because of him, but inflicted on us by others or circumstances. And yet it's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to prove our faith genuine, as we read in 1 Peter 1. Or to to bring ultimate praise and honor and glory to God. Jesus, the most loved, was disciplined the most. You know, sometimes, you know, hard times come and our and we don't know anything but to, to survive it. And sometimes that's the case where, you know, sometimes you're in a place in life where you just got to hold on. And there is truth to that. Verse 11, the passage that, you know, my parents showed me often was, it produces a harvest of righteousness and of peace for, for who? For those who have been trained by it. You know, the reality is that that discipline will not bear the, re- the results, the fruit that we hope for, unless we make the decision to be trained. Trained is, it's active, it's intentional. And so for the time that we have left, I want to ask the question, what stops us from being trained? You know, the first thing that I would see is I think it's a lack of perspective. You know, Jesus, as we fix our eyes on him, it says, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. What type of perspective, isn't it? It's amazing to think, but how? How did he in that moment go, I can be joyful about this type of torture and ridicule and pain? Why joy? Well, I think he ultimately knew what that would produce in him and what opportunity that would provide for us. You know, what perspective did he have? He thought of you. He thought of me. He thought of his father. You know, it's true that, you know, in life, on the mission field, certainly in Europe, it's not always easy. Sometimes trials come. I feel it. You know, I remember days where I've just gone home and just needed a hug, where I just feel like this is hard. And yet the question we have to ask ourselves is, and I think what Jesus The question he had to ask himself is, was it supposed to be easy, this? No, but it was supposed to be worth it. And you know, that's 
when we have trials, you know, 1 Peter 1 is a great passage to continue to remember. This is an opportunity to have faith that is genuine. You know, life is temporary. Have we not become more in touch with our mortality during these times? Life is short. If we think always of the short term, we miss much of the perspective we need to truly persevere. Jesus had that long term in mind. We are not invincible. And truly what matters solely is with our lives, we can glorify God. There's nothing else that truly matters. You know, I think the second thing that stops us from being trained is a fear of shame. And this was, a, this was the part of the passage that really, to be honest, came alive to me as I was reading it during this time. I've always, I kind of have always read over scorning at shame. What does that even mean? Is that a word that you've used very often in your, I scorn that, you know, I, I just, it's not one I use very often. As I looked into what that word means, you know, there's, this, there's, there's certainly this hatred, this this contempt, there's also this idea of thinking little of. You know, Jesus, he not only looked at the cross with joy, but all the shame involved with it, he thought, whatever. Whatever, that's nothing compared to how my God feels about me. You know, I think so often in life, we live a life where we try and avoid shame. And we try and avoid shame by avoiding responsibility versus looking at the cross. You know, the reality is that in view of the cross and fixing our eyes on Jesus, shame has no place. And yet oftentimes we try and forgive ourselves instead of letting Jesus forgive us. You know, I hear this a lot, honestly, this, and, and I see it on social media, this idea, I refuse to apologize, dot, 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 dot. And just, honestly, it's a sentence, a phrase that just should be rarely ever said. There's so many different ways to say I'm sorry. So many, even if you were doing your best, if you were trying your hardest, if it was your, your greatest intent, if you had... Whatever, if you see the pain of others, it has nothing to do with you. I'm sorry that you're experiencing that. This idea of avoiding responsibility, avoiding weakness or vulnerability or any admission of guilt or fault. We honestly, if we look at the example of the government, of leadership positions, how rare is it to just hear the words, I'm sorry, or wow, I could have done that better. It's just, it's not there, and why? I think it has a large part to do with our fear of shame. If you say you're sorry, if you admit that I'm weak, wow, if we confess our sin, you lost the game. And yet that, when you look at the cross, we're able to look at our shame and think little of it. You know, that's nothing. We're able to be who we are. We're able to be open about our lives. We have nothing to hide because our eyes are fixed on the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let's talk about confession. You know, this time, there's certainly many ways to stay connected, but you can also hide. You can hide in your home. Are you making the phone calls? Are you doing what's necessary to keep your heart in the light? You know, I got another question for you as we close. How do you respond when you're corrected by God or others? You know, is it with a how dare you? Or I don't deserve this? Or am I a child? Why are you talking to me like I'm five years old? As if verse 11 is only for five-year-olds. You know, the question that we should be asking ourselves instead is, is it possible that in this moment... I have an opportunity to be more holy. Is is there more holiness to share in? You know, the fact of the matter is that as we look at this passage, the very fact that God practices discipline is proof that discipleship is a journey. We have not arrived. We are called to grow more and more into the image of Christ. You know, it's not enough 
to have an intellectual faith or to have some sufficient understanding of correct doctrine. It's holiness that will bring you to heaven. If you read verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We must actively follow our pioneer and perfecter, wanting to imitate him more and more, and gratefully accepting the discipline we need to grow. In so doing, we receive a harvest of peace and righteousness that he promises. To close off, I just have a couple questions for you. Are you accepting right now or rejecting the Lord's discipline? How about this? Are you facing trials? What lessons can you learn? What is God exposing in your heart? What opportunities do you have to be more like our pioneer, to follow in his footsteps? You know, do you view God's discipline as a sign of his deep affection for you? And what can you do to allow this discipline to truly train, train you. You know, I love my son. And you know, uh, there's many different, you know, sometimes he gets timeouts, different forms of discipline. I kind of think that, I'm not saying that this is a fact, but there is something too, we're almost all being put in timeout, like the world is, to like, you need to think about what you're doing. And I'm not sure, again, I'm not saying that God did that, that God spread this, you know, th this virus or, or whatever, but I do think that it's a trial. And with that, it's an opportunity. You know, with my son, after discipline, you know, he says he's sorry. I give him a big hug, a big kiss, and we go about our day. We move on, and that's what we can do when we fix our eyes on the pioneer and perfecter. When we don't look at our shame, when we view trials with joy, we can look and we can learn lessons and continue to prove our faith genuine and grow to be more like him in his image. I love you guys. I miss you. Can't wait to see you again.